Okay, hello and welcome everybody to this SimScale webinar. Uh, my name is David. I am the product manager here at SimScale for structural analysis. I'm joined by um, our guest speaker today, Massimo Savi, who is a product design engineer at ITW Automotive, who have been a SimScale customer for a couple of years now. Um, and he's going to introduce himself in, in a few moments and, and then we're going to dig into one of his projects around, around how they use SimScale to develop um, fastening components within the industry. Before we do that, I'm going to give a quick uh, run through of the agenda and a little bit of an introduction to SimScale as well. Okay. So today, um, I've already mentioned we're going to be primarily looking at a customer case study, a Massimo study. Um, we'll get into that further down the line after a quick introduction to SimScale. Uh, and then we will have a demonstration of the SimScale platform itself before taking um, questions and, and trying to get through as many of those as possible before the end of the session. So if you do have questions along the way, please do make sure that you, you comment in the, in the GoToWebinar chat function. So you can ask your questions there and uh, then me and Massimo will, will try to answer them before the end of the session. So what is SimScale and what do we do? So SimScale, we bring advanced structural analysis directly into product design. Now, traditionally, that has not been possible. Um, so I want to go through what makes SimScale different and, and, and how we actually make this a reality. So SimScale is a cloud native tool. It's accessed directly in your browser, which means that licensing is, is super, super easy. It's, it makes the whole product very accessible. Um, and it's also driven by cloud simulation uh, itself. So it's a cloud computation. So any heavy lifting that's going on in, in the simulation workflow is done remotely, right? So you can access this from, from, a, from a laptop or, or any machine um, at anywhere at any time um, and, uh, and, and log into your, your engineering simulation platform. We offer one platform with broad physics, okay? So, so that's, that's from linear static analysis up to nonlinear dynamic analysis, all in the same platform in one central um, engineering ecosystem. And as well as that, as well as the structural analysis, we've got the, the fluid analysis and the thermal analysis in exactly the same place. So with very similar workflows that are translatable between um, different disciplines. So it means learning curves are, 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 um, are, are super short to, 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 to switch between simulation types. And it really is about centralizing knowledge and making sure that, that everyone is gaining the most uh, possible from their simulation um, tools. The fact that we are cloud native um, is, is a huge advantage for, for the way that our customers can collaborate with one another, but also how they can collaborate with the SimScale engineers, with the support engineers. So we provide um, engineering support directly in the platform, so live support for all of our professional users. Um, and the way that we can do this is through um, is through the cloud cloud native aspect. So there's no need for data transfer. When you choose to share a project with us, we can we can directly access it. We can point you on the way, and this really helps out with the learning process as well as troubleshooting once you're in your, your simulation projects. Again, it's all about cloud. Um, and, and, and one of the main things that comes with that is the, the, the ability to run simulations at any scale. So not dependent on your local hardware, um, you can run a small analysis with, with maybe a couple of parts to a larger assembly with up to 10 million degrees of freedom. Um, or, or uh, whatever you want to do with, with, with a larger remote machine, okay? So you can scale up on the project size, but you can also run uh, an infinite amount of parallel simulation. So you're not just running one simulation in a queue in a cloud server, you can run as many different simulations as you like at the same time. Uh, and that is really beneficial for these advanced structural analyses where there is um, the, the, the resource requirement and, and occasionally quite long um, run times if you're looking to, to model 20 load steps or, or doing a dynamic analysis for, for a number of seconds. That's going to take a lot of time. So rather than it taking up your whole PC um, to, to run that simulation, you can be getting on with the rest of your work, working on different projects, trying out different design candidates on the same project. Um, and, uh, and running all of those simulations in parallel. 
Now, a big um, blocker to a lot of organizations for advanced structural analysis is the, the, the licensing of traditional simulation tools. Now, what we want to do is really bring that price package down um, and still um, enable the amount of physics or, or the, the broad range of physics that allows you to do advanced structural analysis all in a single uh, license fee um, and, uh, and, and accessed again via the, the, the browser-based service, which means it can be rolled out to organizations very, very easily. You need your login details um, and that's it in terms of licensing, okay? So what are the benefits of simulation within product design? Okay, what can, we, what, what can we expect to gain from doing simulations as early as possible? Now it's all about informing design, driving innovation and validating those decisions. So it means low, low cost design space exploration. So you can try out um, many different virtual design candidates as you like upstream, uh, which allows you to try maybe some, some crazy ideas and we'll hear from Massimo about, about what, what, what kind of ideas he comes up with as well um, in a few moments. Uh, but it really allows for increasing innovation. It also allows to reduce costs. So you see mistakes further upstream before you get down into prototyping, which can be time wastage as well as resource wastage as well. If, if you allow a design to go through without, without simulation upstream, it can, it can come back to bite you um, further down the line. So before we get into prototyping, it's, it's, it's super valuable to be able to disqualify, disqualify the poor concepts, right? And if you know upstream that they're, that they're not going to perform well in physical prototyping, don't build them, right? Because of the high costs associated with them. So this allows to, over, to, to increase the overall design cycle and, and uh, time to market for a product. Um, and, uh, and finally, the, the, you have the ability with uh, virtual, um, virtual testing or, or simulation, uh, engineering simulation, you have the ability to replicate physical testing. Okay, um, and obviously physical testing is super important in the engineering process, but what physical testing does not give you is point-wise insight into your mechanical behavior of your part, whereas simulation does. So it allows you to see that the stress hotspots, allows you to really um, quantify the, the amount of resonance in your model if you're doing vibration, for example, but you get to see it at point-wise detail, which is something you don't get from physical testing. So then this allow, allows you to do localized mitigation and really work on, on, on different design concepts uh, with, with your, the, the, the best information available. Okay, I hope that wasn't too boring for you for you all. Um, let's now get into the, the most important part of today's session, and that is the customer project, where we're going to be looking at some plastic snap fit analysis, which is the analysis type that, that Massimo uses in his design process. And again, this is part of the advanced structural analysis that we bring into the product design process. So I'm gonna hand over to Massimo now, and, uh, and he'll take us through a, a, a project that he's done using the SimScale platform. Um, hello everyone, I'm Massimo. I started in ITW in 2007. I originally from Italy and I've been working with simulation about 10 years in Italy and now uh, almost six years here in Sweden. Uh, so a couple of years ago we switched to another, uh, from another supplier to SimScale and we had an update especially when concerning the interface and the accessibility of the software and the fact that this is on cloud. So it's much more flexible and it can be applied to many designers because it doesn't require a lot of skills to get uh, to get going. And uh, the main benefit that I see in using a simulation for uh, our business, we ITW is, is, is mainly a company that pr uh, produces fasteners for automotive uh, industry. That means that we work with the uh, connection parts, uh, parts that need to snap into each other to have a retention force. So it's, we use uh, polyamide, poly, uh, pl general plastic like uh, POM or polyamide mainly. And then so it's, it's very important for us to have a lower insertion force, for example, when we talk about a fixation that goes into a hole and a high retention force. And sometimes we have a very awkward situation and we need to test different solutions because we have some limitation for insertion force that is for Volvo, for example, around 50 newtons if you push something with a finger, 30 newtons if you use two fingers and 50 newtons if you use a palm. So 
by say, having said so, uh, we always struggle to the fact that we need to have a high retention force with a low insertion force. So what I do usually make a design, export it into SimScale, run a, simu a quick simulation, understand and get the right direction and make different models and, and understand if, if I'm going to the right direction or not. It's not at this stage that important to know exactly the, the data, the, the final data, but it's important for me to understand if my logic makes sense or not. And sometimes it's also surprising because it's not something that is so logical. Uh, and then actually by using the simulation, you can understand many, much more about the behavior of a component. And then it gives you, increase your expertise when you are designing things. Uh, that means uh, that's what we mean for spark innovation. Uh, so, um, yeah, so um, we, let's, so take this example. This is a standard clip that is called filler pipe clip. It's just holding uh, some uh, liquid cooling pipe and is attached to a little hole. Uh, so we are concentrated to the uh, to the anchor clip that is uh, fixing this clip in position into this aluminium hole. This clip is uh, is uh, furnished in the new XC90 uh, recently shown uh, presented. Uh, so we basically started did a prototype tool to do all the tests, and uh, the anchor clip was quite short. Um, our goal, uh, when we tested the anchor clip, we had uh, uh, insertion force that were a little bit too high, especially to the fact that we tested different material, also recycled ones. So basically we started from a standard material and then we went to a little fiberglass that uh, gave us some result. We can go to the following slide. Uh, that might have been, uh, they were a, a little bit too high. Uh, so basically uh, what we can see here, I made a design, I push this, I cut the, the component in half, I push into the hole, and then I see what, what kind of result I have. Uh, also the materials are elastoplastic, so they behave, uh, they try to replicate uh, what is happening uh, in the real behavior of the plastic. Uh, what we had was a clip was was light, uh, slightly too high as insertion force. So when we kick off the production tool, uh, I decided to make this anchor clip longer, but by making the width, and uh, you can see from X1 to P1, we increased the length by five millimeters, and by just increasing this length, we drastically decreased the insertion force by 80, 85%. Uh, in uh, in the lab test, uh, the extraction force was, was similar, but in reality was not because of the movement. When you pull up this part, is not uh, you're not really pulling it uh, uh, normal to the hole, but you maybe twisting the clip. So there were there were cases when the clip was disconnected. So what we wanted to do is is go back and, and make this uh, anchor clip uh, tougher and, and stronger and that is this uh, as it was so we went back and i did some several combinations so what, what our goal was to decrease the initial insertion force by 20, 15% uh, just enough to be uh, uh, under 30 newtons but not too much otherwise we would encounter different different problems so I did several uh, several attempts by adding a rib that you can see in the central picture in, in red, increasing the thickness by 0 0.1 millimeter or increasing the width of the clip, of the anchor clip itself with a combination of possibilities. So we ran several simulation. Uh, it's, it's quite good because you actually uh, update the model and all the settings are, are still in place. Uh, so you don't, you don't spend so much time to test as many as any different options as you would like to. Uh, so by, then we end up, we, we decided to, to go for the, uh, the solution that we call R, R0 which is a combination between a three little, little modification. Um, and uh, we started uh, with a prototype tool that was, uh, that was a 29.6. In reality, it was slightly high, higher. Uh, then we went down to five newtons, and now we are back, and we are around 25.6. That means that we reach exactly what we want. We have a decrease, insertion force decrease, about 14% but exactly the same extraction force. So 
this is the result and without the help of this game we would have done, we would have done perhaps many many different prototypes and spent a lot of time and a lot of money by by uh, trying to find the right tuning of this fixation so this is a standard case a pretty simple one but it shows the potential of the software and the help that and the support that it has uh, for for me i'm not the only one that uses SimScale. some of my colleagues also are starting to use it and it's just uh, yeah quite handy especially when you want to try different solution not as, this is kind of a standard one but we have more complicated solution than sometimes we want to check before we implement it on a prototype tool i think this i said awesome. enough if you have any question go ahead uh, i'm all ears Perfect. Yeah, I, I, I would um, like to bring up the, 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 the point about the different material models that you've used mm. in, in, the, in the analysis as well. So you can see for the, the X1 design, right, we've got two different values. So one is the 29.6 and one is the 14.5. The um, and, and that's because SimScale, it gives you the options to, to, um, to model different materials. Um, with different elastoplastic uh, material properties. So for each um, design, what Massimo has done here, which is pretty cool, is use two different elastoplastic curves to, to model the mechanical behavior of the, of the, um, of the polyamide. So one for the, the dry, um, like on the data sheets, and one for the, the fully wet um, material. But Massimo, which, what are the materials in reality? Would they be the fully wet or are they the fully dry? Or well, they... it's it's hard. To, I mean, with a, I mean the polyam. The problem with polyamide is, is that it varies very much with the moisture that is in the atmosphere. So that's why in Sweden we tend to use uh, POM most of the times because to avoid uh, this kind of flex. So I know that in the southern Europe uh, or in France and in Italy they are more into the polyamide. Uh, it's we usually is depending uh, in a 23 degrees 50 percent uh, moisture i mean we we are in there in between there so it's it's uh, uh when we test apart in reality we need to make sure it's either completely dry or either completely moist or so that is a, an extra tricky thing to that we deal with when we are dealing with polyamide we have to double all our simulation and and, and, and we always have a range of mm -hmm. load uh, so basically, if you want to be lower than a certain amount of load for an introduction, we have to take the worst scenario. So we have to take an extremely dry material and a the small tolerance hole. Mm -hmm. So we know that we will always be low. Uh, that is the uh, most uh, the worst case scenario. And same opposite thing we do when they do an extraction. We have to take on completely moisture material with a biggest tolerance hole and try to pull it and we know that <coughs> that is the worst condition we will ever find mm -hmm. so yeah it, it's uh, but this is not uh, uh, if we want some 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 real figures uh, uh, that we want to do a peep up or or to have some data that we put on a drawing this is not uh, why is uh, this software is is made for the software is made for at the very beginning of the project to test different solution in a quick way it doesn't and and then what i usually do is if i have an increase of a solution by 10 percent and i have a physical part i know that if I apply the 10% of the physical part, it will probably reflect the reality. So I work in percentage instead of absolute values. And well, that's that, the uh, trend analysis, right? This is this is the essence of trend analysis within the within the design cycle. So because um, as you say, right, it's it's very, very hard to replicate reality absolutely. Yeah, um, the yes. necessarily pushing in, in a single direction. Um, you don't know the, the, the material um, imperfections and things like this. So, so there is also friction in place. It's hard to figure out friction between different materials. You know, speed. You know, all these all these parts uh, cannot. Uh, they they could be set in a simulation, but usually it's data that you don't have since the beginning, because also the, your customer doesn't know exactly what the part will do, what yeah, is exactly. the situation it will be used. So. It's, it's, so it's, you rely on yeah. the on the percentages, right? And then that drives your design decisions. You you mm. you whittle down the design candidates, then you come mm. up with your 
final one before going into prototyping and you and it gives you the the, the, the confidence right to select mm. a, a, a yes a candidate for prototyping yeah. Just by looking at the animation, when you do an introduction, the colors of the stressing of the material, you, you understand where are the most stressed parts, you can add more material, take away some material here and there. So it, it's, it's, if you get uh, understand how it works, which is actually pretty easy, it, it, it teaches you a lot in general. And then it gets, uh, it, yeah, it tells you, uh, gives you some, some uh, good uh, hint of what your next design will be. Okay. So, well, I think that's a good um, segue to then have a look at at Tim's go have a look at some animations and 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 maybe take some insights away from from having a look at it uh, and at an animation and the results and then and I'll I'll show you a little bit about the simulation. Um, so so um, Massimo shared the, the the project with me here because I want to give a bit of an introduction to those who don't know SimScale. Um, mention some of the new features that we have um, and, and hopefully give you a flavor um, of what it's like to, to use SimScale in the platform. Um, so, so here is the, the animation or the final result of the, the design R0. Um, and you can see here that you get a lot of information just by looking at the, 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 the kinematics of the snapping. I think that can also be interesting and, and sometimes not necessarily um, how you would think in, in terms of common sense. I think that's actually a quote that you, you put at the beginning of the, of the, uh, of the slides, Massimo, that it can really teach you a lot about your products by giving you that, that, that point-wise insight into the, into the behavior. Um, so here we have the, 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 the plastic fastener going through the punch hole and we see where we have the buildup of high stresses indicated in red during the snapping. Um, and the main the main buildup is on the on the on the rib itself, so that's taking a lot of a lot of heat um, for for the actual snapping process. Now let me show you how you get to get to this point. Right, this is the SimScale interface. As you can see, it's all part of just a browser-based application, right? So it can be accessed at any at any time from anywhere, um, and because it's driven by cloud computation, it can be accessed at any scale, right? These are quite small small models. The fasteners are, are fairly small in general, but for high fidelity, you might actually want a fairly um, high fidelity mesh on here as well, right? So um, for for local for for, for local. Um, Local software, this, this might actually take a, a fair bit of time based on the on, on the mesh size, right? If you've got a fairly um, detailed mesh in and around here, then then that, that, that could uh, require some some larger compute resources. But obviously, with with cloud computation, that's that's nothing. That's not for you to worry about, right? We take care of the resources for getting mm -hmm. the job done. So here is a well, I've got three simulations here for the different designs. We've got the, the three different geometries uploaded to the platform. And we have the three different simulations for, for each design. Now, within a simulation, you set it up as, as such. The most important part of it is actually establishing what we call a nonlinear contact between the two parts. Um, and that's done pretty simply um, with, with SimScale, where you assign the, 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 the surface pairing, so the, the, um, the slave services against the master services in your nonlinear contact. And then you define how stiff do you want this contact to be. Now, this is a new feature for us. This is material-based contact stiffness. So this is helping automate the nonlinear contact process. Um, once you've got your physical contact in place, um, it's important to add your materials. So here's the, the punch hole is steel. Um, and we've got a number of different materials here. We've got the, the uh, polyamide that um, Massimo has been working with, both um, either as, as defined as linear elastic material behavior, so for just a very simple initial simulation. But for those final simulations that Massimo was running, we're with these full um, nonlinear material properties where you define the full stress strain curve in true stress, true strain um, to define the full uh, material behavior based on, on uniaxial tensile testing. Um, let's let's see this in action. I'll I'll go through the full setup first before before I set up a couple of simulations um, and uh, and then you'll see it in action as well. So in terms of boundary conditions, we've got the fixed support around the side. Uh, we've applied a symmetry plane to account for the other side of the model, and we're pushing it down uh, from the top here to 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 simulate that pushing behavior. Now you see I've I've just added a constant value here, but automatically for a nonlinear analysis that will be ramped up over the simulation interval. 
we've we've already had a little look at the mesh, um, so I won't I won't go into that again um, unless there are questions about that further down the line. Um, so now let's have a look at starting a simulation. Um, I will change the material for the push pin. So what we can look at is I'll use one of my materials, a uh, nylon sixty six. That's assigned then on the on the on the push on the push pin, and we can start off a simulation here. Okay. Name it with the with the material name, for example, and then we'll see that running off in in the cloud. And there it goes. So you can see in our job status down here, we've got the the snap fit simulation running. And what I can now do is go back to one of the other designs, for example, the the P1, which doesn't have the rib or the um, extrusions. That that one that gave us the very low introduction force that was actually. Um, far too small because it didn't then have the snapping feeling um, that uh, we can we can try this as well with a with a different material for example and start that one off and then you'll see that both of these simulations then run at the same time in the cloud right they're not queuing um, they they will run on separate machines um, so that means you can run multiple simulations all at the same time okay. Um, a final thing before before we head back to the slides for some questions is the way that we, um, I mentioned it earlier, the way that we actually bring support into the platform itself. Because with, with structural analysis, um, there can be a lot of questioning, right, in terms of result um, interpretation. It might help to get um, the, the SimScale engineers to take a look at the results with you, um, give you some advice on if, it, if it's a new simulation um, analysis type um, that you're getting into. We're there to help, right? So you can you can contact us directly in the platform. Um, you can choose to share the project with support as well, such that the support engineers can jump directly into the project. And then we can really help you out um, to, to get you through the problem when you are experiencing the problem, or just to give you some advice to, to help you over the learning curve of getting simulation under your belt, okay? So I hope that makes sense. Um, and we've now had a quick look at the, the SimScale platform. What I'll do is I'll jump back to the the slides and we can ask for we can ask for some some questions if there's any questions coming in now i just need to open the the questions panel here we are Okay, so we've got some, some, some fairly advanced questions, which is great. Um, so one from Reza. Can one know if an implicit or explicit, um, we're talking about dynamic um, solutions here, is, is happening, I think, is, is how he's trying to phrase the question. So what kind of time stepping or type of mesh and what software is used? Okay, so um, in, this, in this analysis that we've just looked at here, that was a nonlinear static analysis. So inherently that's going to be an implicit um, analysis where we'll be using the newton raphson method to um, to iterate through the, the nonlinear static problem. Um, we don't go into explicit dynamics. That's not our field yet. Uh, what we do offer is implicit dynamics analysis for, for example, um, a shock analysis um, of, a, of, a, of electronics cabinet. We do shock analysis um, quite often. Uh, we also do um, implicit frequency domain dynamics as well. So looking at um, modal analysis, looking at harmonic analysis for replicating shaker table testing, for example. Uh, but again, that's all within the, the implicit domain. The type of meshing that we offer is um, both hex and tet and prismatic. Um, first and second order elements. So we we um, we remain in the three D uh, the three D world because we want to make it as easy to use as possible from three D CAD. So we 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 remain in the three D universe, um, and then we'll use solid body meshing techniques. Um, and uh, and as I've already mentioned, that can be either hexahedral elements, tetrahedral elements, or prismatic elements as well. Fatigue analysis, in particular about fatigue, um, again from, from Reza. Um, we haven't gone into fatigue analysis yet, right? Um, but with fatigue analysis, right, the, the first step is having your accurate stress data. 
we will provide the accurate stress data, and then you can use that data to go and use third-party um, fatigue tools like ENCODE or, or Limit Fatigue, um, these kind of tools that, uh, or, or even do your own third uh, post-processing manually um, for, for fatigue analysis. So we don't have anything directly in the platform yet. Um, it's, it's certainly on the roadmap, um, but, uh, but we're going to have to wait a little bit for that. Okay. We have one from Patrick. Is it possible to use the data results that come from a mold flow simulation for your analysis? Unfortunately, no, not yet. We haven't we haven't plugged into. Um, so this is this is about when you have uh, plastic um, molding simulations and you really have the the, the thread orientation or the or the structural um, orientations within your within your um, component. Um, that's obviously critical information um, for the for the FEA analysis, but we don't go in that direction yet. Um, certainly for the future, but uh, but again, that's fairly um, on 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 uh, more on the advanced side in terms of in terms of material handling. So we haven't gone into that direction. I think the first steps we'll, we'll go into mm -hmm. is anisotropic material behavior, followed by composites, and then we all will have the capability to bring in um, fully fully three D uh, varying. Um, uh, material definitions from, for example, mold, mold flow. I know there are, um, I, I used to work at Autodesk, so I, I, I know that there are workflows going from mold flow, for example, to, to NASTRAN analysis and, uh, and things like this. So um, I know that, that that is out there, but uh, we haven't looked in that, in that direction just yet. Okay, any further questions? We're now at the... Um, at half past, um, Massimo, did you have any other, other further points to add to the to to the discussion? Uh, not that I can think of. Uh, I think we we cover most of the most of the things. Uh, I I also been interested in in the be able to export small uh, flow simulation into the sim scale, but you know I think. Uh, for now, because of the use of the software that is, it helps you to understand how the parts behaves, uh, is I think is is uh, is still good enough uh, to have a standard part because the more you add information you uh, and data, you, the more you need to make sure that these data are correct. Otherwise, it gets more risky and risky. So. I, from my point of view, it's 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 always a good practice to keep things as easy as possible, because uh, the more uh, complicated data you you can you set in, the more uh, it's risky to get a very wrong result that will lead to bad bad choices. So. Um, yeah, use common sense, um, make a simulation as simple as possible, try to simplify it and, and proceed step by step instead of putting everything together at once. Mm. Uh, so that is just my, my comment about that. And yeah, uh, yeah the, and another few words about the meshing. Uh, you can see the meshing is very, very fine. And, and it would take, if you would be working locally on your machine, it would take hours just to mesh a part like that. While in sim, in sim scale, it's uh, it's much faster because it's, it's, it's working on the cloud. And that uh, that's a good benefit of it. Mm. We've got one, for, I think we've got time to squeeze this, this final question in. So any possibility to correct the model automatically if it is having any interference or model errors when we import as, as a step file, for example, um, from Sanjeev. Uh, thanks for the question, Sanjeev. Um, yes, absolutely. So we have our own CAD mode in SimScale. Uh, so when you upload your, your models, that can be in, in step format or any native format as Parasolid or Invent Apart file or however you want to um, import your model. Uh, once you bring it in and it does have modeling errors, for example, interferences, small gaps, uh, tiny surfaces, things like this that might affect meshing, that can be cleaned up in SimScale itself with automated tools. So we have automatic interference, um, fix interference, we call it, which is going to detect the interferences and, and, and remove them from the, from the CAD model. You also have the ability to, to find small gaps and close small gaps. That's more for CFD than FEA. Um, but it can be helpful in, in, in some cases in, in FEA as well. But uh, yes, we've got automated CAD tools on the platform as well, which means, and, and that's really designed to be everything you need to get your model ready for simulation. We're not going to replace a CAD tool where you want to do all your design changes, but we're there to offer the tools 
um, that are going to get you going on, on simulation, either to um, simplify your simulation or to troubleshoot it as well. Okay. Um, okay. Automatic detection of bolted contacts. <laughs> yeah, we got well, lots of lots of questions flagging in the in the last couple of minutes. That's great. Um, so another one about um, any option for automatic detection of bolted contacts. Yes, absolutely. Um, if you bring in a model, um, an assembly model into SimScale, we're going to automatically find the contacts <coughs> um, in your in your assembly, um, and they will then automatically be glued together with bonded contacts. Um, you have the option to then adapt any of these those contacts, make them sliding contacts, convert them to nonlinear physical contacts like the contacts we've seen today. Um, and uh, and and uh, and manually address them as, as much as possible. But automatically, you bring an assembly; it will automatically be bonded together at um, touching surfaces or within a, a a gap tolerance. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for for um, participating and for all the great questions. Um, and uh, lastly, but definitely not least, I need to say a big big thank you to to Massimo. Um, for providing the, the the project, giving us some insight into how ITW is working with SimScale, and really sharing a lot of what I think is great expertise in terms of how to use simulation in early stage design. So not necessarily worrying about super accurate validation where we need to get it perfect the first time, but concentrating on trend analysis where you've got a few design candidates and you want to to land on the best candidate before going to prototyping. So. Um, I think that's super valuable to hear from the, the the practical side of things, whereas I come from the simulation side of things. So we we sometimes um, meet in the middle, right? And it's really important to get the the, the perspective of of Massimo in these kind of situations. So thank you so much for that, um, and uh, and I look forward to the the, the project that we're going to be doing together in the future. Thank you. The same for you. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have a great day. Goodbye.